Hello everyone and welcome to the final lecture in this short series on uh, high performance computing. Um, this final lecture is going to be quite short and we'll just look at the future of HPC, what direction um, HPC is going and what that means um, generally for users of codes on HPC machines and people who produce programs for HPC machines. Um, and again, if you want to reuse this material, feel free to do so as long as you use the correct attribution. So what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is future architectures, um, the sort of things people are looking at building going forwards and what impact it has on processes and memory and the performance, and what the challenges will be in terms of the software, and maybe what impacts this will have for standard computing as well, as well as just HPC. So what will HPC machines look like in five, possibly ten years' time. Well, this is often a fool's game in some sense because any predictions that I make here will obviously be proved wrong in time, but still, I'll, we'll stick our neck out and see what we can say. So what people are trying to build at the moment are what are called exascale machines. The current largest HPC systems are run on the order of tens of petaflops. A flop is a floating point operation every second, so it's a measure, some sort of measure of the speed of the machine. And going forwards, we're almost to the stage of 100 petaflop machines. Um, and the idea is by 2020 to have an exaflop machine, which is essentially a 1,000 petaflop machines. And this table so, so tries to show the different characteristics of what we think the machines will look like. So you can see here that going from 100 um, petaflops where we are net sort of where we are now to um, the exaflop all the performance is essentially coming from increased performance of a node a single node so that means it's the single computer performance that's getting faster not the number of things we're connecting together that only that only is projected to double from say 500 thousand nodes to a million nodes connected together whereas the amount of performance on a node is expected to increase by an order of magnitude or so. And this is mostly through concurrency. This is mostly by adding extra cores on the node, going from, say, 100 core, no 100 core nodes, that's what essentially what a, an accelerator looks like at the moment, or a Xeon Phi processor, to what the future processor looks like. And the other thing you can take away from this is that the other parts of the system, in terms of the mem amount of memory, the memory performance, the interconnect performance, um, the I.O. performance, all of those um, are not increasing by the same order of magnitude as this concurrency. Um, and the reason this is happening is all to do with this line at the bottom. It's power. It's how you power a machine. So currently machines use about 10 megawatts. And we only have room, really, in the capacity of electricity we have available for powering these machines to double that. So we have to get a lot more performance, a hundred times the performance, or ten times the performance, at for only twice the cost of power. And the way you do this is by increasing the concurrency on a node. So you hope that you keep your perform the power draw of the node down, but increase the number of cores there. What this actually does is change the balance fundamentally of um, how HPC systems together. So you get more floating point compute power per processor, um, but you can only exploit it via ha having parallelism in your code. And you get lots of these low power computer elements combined together in some way. The memory um, essentially would be packaged with the packaged with the processor rather than having at the moment as you have separate um, piece of silicon and then your memory connected by some sort of bus, some sort of wires, the memory will be fused in to the processor to increase the power efficiency, the span, speed and the bandwidth. But the cost of this is you're going to have a small amount of memory per core to exploit. So your programs are going to have to be much more memory efficient. So this ends up what being called what's called the system on a chip. So instead of separate processor memory and network interface, you get the whole thing combined together onto a single piece of silicon, essentially, because this is the only way to improve the power efficiency. So there's less scope for customization. You buy a package. If you need more memory that's going to be the package, you're just going to have to have uh, memory attached on the side, which will be slow. These different levels of hem 
um, memory hierarchy. And the largest electricity costs for machine really at the moment are shifting data about disk to memory and memory to processor. But uh, so to increase that power efficiency, you put them packet memory on the chip, and the power cost comes down. But what it means is that any extra memory that you attach outside of that package will have much slower memory access, probably even slower than the memory access is now, um, to so that you can stay within the power envelope that you have available. What effect does this actually have on the software? Because that's where most of us live. I mean, personally, I'm in no doubt that the engineers will be able to solve the problems, pose them to get to these large scale machines but actually being able to exploit them using software is the is as difficult a challenge. So what does it mean for the application? The future of HPC and for everybody else in fact is that you're going to have lots of cores per node, many more than you have now, little memory per core um, and lots of compute power per network interface. That's essentially lots of compute power per node. Okay. Um, it might be at a lower clock speed as well. And so the extra compute power here is all coming from parallelism. And what you've actually done is change the balance of, balance of commute, compute to communication power and compute to memory radically. So you have much more compute, much less memory, much less communication. That means you need to be able to exploit the parallelism on the node much more efficiently. You've got to exploit the parallelism all the levels. You've got to be really careful about how you exploit the parallelism in node and exploit the memory hierarchy efficiently. So what does this sound like? It sounds a bit like the shared memory programming. You're going to have to somehow be very, very good at exploiting the shared memory programming and also the level of parallelism we haven't really talked about very much, which is the level of pro parallelism on the core itself in the floating point unit. We might have uh, floating point units that can perform operations on multiple um, floating point numbers at once. So, for many um, applications, we'll need new algorithms because the key to the algorithm is not that it's strictly optimal or even strictly mathematically um, strictly math mathematically correct in some senses, and it gives the same answer every time in a deterministic way. But they've got to be able to have more scope for parallelization and more scope for exploiting memory efficiently. So things like mixed precision calculations will become much more important and taking the algorithm report and, use, and using a new algorithm which might be not be optimal but has more scope for parallelization. Yeah. These are the, this is the sort of work that's going to have to go on in the major codes to help let them exploit these new processes that are coming on stream in the future. What happens if you have an application that do not scale? And you see applications like this all the time. I mean, years ago on HPC systems, you would have seen things like Gaussian were huge users. These sorts of molecular electronic structure codes were huge users of HPC. And the reason they're mainly not huge users of, especially the high-end supercomputers anymore, is that the applications simply do not scale to the number of processors. And that's going to happen a lot going forward. So. I guess the good news is, in some sense, if you're not able to act, if you if you don't need to be able to treat larger and more complex problems, you can access more of the current resource size. So essentially, you'll be able to buy a system yourself, almost for your lab, which will have the same amount of compute power that you require an uh, HPC system for at the moment. So that's good. But you might be caught out a bit with the individual core speed decrease. So things might go slow because of that and the decrease in memory per core might restrict the sort of problems you can look at. So there are some options to scale in a trivially parallel way. Um, increasing sampling, using more sophisticated statistical techniques and particularly some of the MD type applications will have great success with this and it may well be the best route for many simulations but there is still the problem that the um, balance of memory to core even without the supercomputers and the interconnect and separate nodes and all those sort of things. The balance of memory per core um, is fundamentally different than it is now. And so a lot of programs and algorithms will have to be have undergo substantial development to be able to to be able to exploit these um, new processor types. So I've alluded to it a bit. What's the impact going to be 
on standard computing on, on my workstation on my laptop the stuff I the stuff I run day to day um, in my lab well it's just parallel everywhere is the main message right so all computes current computers are parallel in some sense from the supercomputers all the way down to mobile phones and most of this parallelism is task based on four to eight cores each application or task runs on an individual core but in the future you're going to have much more parallelism per device tens to hundreds of cores running at low clock speeds and most people do not run hundreds of applications at once on their systems okay so to be able to exploit these cores all applications are going to be, have to be parallel at some level. And so parallel programming skills will be required for all these application developments, scientific and otherwise. This is one of the reasons that parallel programming and understanding parallel programming, the limitations of it, is so important almost for anybody who's working in computational science in some way. So you get more system on chip, more things will be packaged together, lower power. Um, so each individual computer element, each individual node or computer will be more powerful, but it may be more difficult to exploit that power, more complex to harness that power um, for the research work you want to do. So if that sounds pretty bleak, then I'm sorry for that. It's not that's not what I'm trying to get across. There's a huge opportunity here to ha use this compute power that's going to trickle down to everybody to. Um, do new research and do new things. It's going to take an investment of effort, particularly on the software side, to be able to exploit it in a useful way for most people. So in summary, everybody, I think, will be affected by a change of architectures, whether you're a programmer or not, because your programs and your problems you used to treat may not carry on working in the same way you, as you are used to. Um, the question is still open, I think, as to whether software pack, current software packages will be able to cope with the change. Will the uh, change require new packages, new software, so instead of, I don't know, um, NAMD or uh, LAMPS, you would have to use something new that's been developed specifically with these architects in mind, or whether um, NAMD or LAMPS are going to be able to be modified to take advantage of these new codes and similarly other applications in other areas. It's still an open question, I think. But parallelism is the key to all future architectures, both for HPC and personal computing whatever you mean by personal computing, be it phones, wearable technology, or anything like that. The more, and the good news is more computing power is going to be available at all levels for everybody, but you have to be able to exploit it somehow. So depending on the parallel programmers or depending on how you pose your problem um, for use in HPC facilities, um, it's going to be an interesting time, I think, and certainly an interesting time for software developers and these, with these new architectures. So again, here are EPCC's contact details. Um, if you're interested in working with us to help improve the power performance of your code or um, get access to different HPC facilities, please just let, let us know via the website and we'd be happy to help out. Um, thank you for listening to this short series of lectures on high-performance computing. I hope you found it um, useful and interesting, or one of the two. <laughs>